Wow, I'm, I'm not sure that uh, I know who he's talking about there. Uh, but I tell you, it, it is good to be here. It's good to be home. Um, I uh, have very fond memories of these halls and of these classrooms and of, of many conversations with many of the faces that are looking back at me. And uh, it is just a blessing uh, to be here at this institution. Um, I want to thank the center for hosting me. Um, and I want to thank, you know, I've had the privilege of, of hosting a center intern um, in the past. It was one of the best decisions I've ever made. Uh, it was great work, scholarly work, um, and I, I put him to work. Um, but but it, it was really good, um, a good opportunity. And so today I kind of just want to, you know, I guess I want to give a caveat before we start, and that is I, we're not going to fix the criminal justice system today in about 45 minutes. Unfortunately, uh, believe me, I would try if we, if we, if we, if we could, uh, if I thought it was the possibility. Um, and there are a lot of things that we can talk about. Um, there, there really are. And at the end, I mean, I want to just give the opportunity at the end uh, for, for you to throw any question out there that, that you would like to know. Anything at all. I am an open book. Um, and if you have any questions about the criminal justice system, about what it's like on the inside from um, any kind of reform efforts that are going on in the country today, please ask me or ask me afterwards. I would love to dialogue with you about those, um, about those things. But today, I think um, what I would like to do today is just kind of talk about a couple historical things about our criminal justice system. First, I, I just want to talk, I'm going to talk briefly about what I do and about our organization, but then I want to get to the nitty gritty. And this is going to be a bit of a learning experience, hopefully. We're going to get down into some history. We're going to start talking about some philosophy. We're going to talk about what are the goals of the criminal justice system? What kind of goals should the criminal justice system um, actually pursue? What are the outcomes that we're looking at and how should we measure a, a, a criminal justice system? And then I want to talk about a little bit about what does it mean to be a, um, a Christian attorney um, kind of maneuvering through uh, the criminal justice system. You know, I say it all the time, there is not a better place to be where, where you will see a clash of philosophy as it relates to human nature than you will in the criminal justice system. Um, from the um, proponents who will, who, who will argue that, you know, who, who will argue that People who commit crimes are fundamentally flawed, psych uh, physically flawed, biologically flawed. We need to fix these individuals. From individuals on the other side who will say, you know, crime is, it is de facto a sin problem, and therefore it's a matter of the heart. So you have these tug of war philosophies. So we're going to get into that a little bit. So just real quickly, um, as Ernie mentioned, I, work for, I have the privilege of working for Justice Fellowship, which is the Public Policy and Advocacy Division of Prison Fellowship Ministries. How many in here have heard of Chuck Colson? Probably everybody because you have been to Christian Foundations. Um, but if I, I, I had the privilege of knowing Chuck, and Chuck was a, a great mentor to me. Um, so we, we are the kind of the public policy division of Prison Fellowship Ministries. And so, you know, really Prison Fellowship, as Ernie said, is the largest prison ministry in the world. Um, we're in over 280 prisons in the United States, and we offer anything from Bible studies to 18-month intensive programmings to where we kind of run a whole uh, unit and a whole prison in some cases. And then there's Justice Fellowship, which is we do the boring work of criminal justice policy and advocacy. So, and what we do, I think, is extremely important. We really are trying to change the narrative of criminal justice in America. And so for a long time, Policies in the United States have been lock them, lock them up, throw away the key. The definition of, of, of crime in America is changing rapidly, and we'll, go, and we'll talk about that. The level, of, um, uh, act, the level of activity that is criminalized is growingly increasing. Um, and so when I talk to state legislators, I say, you know, if you take a, if you take a look at the kind of the past 30 years of criminal justice, it's kind of a whack-a-mole, you know, response to criminal justice or to crime. And what I mean by that is some mole will pop up, something bad will happen, we'll whack it really hard, we'll pass a law, we'll hope that that's going to actually deter crime or whatever, but it doesn't, another mole pops up and we just, we just play this game. It's kind of a knee-jerk reaction to crime and a response to crime. And it hasn't gotten us very far. And so what we espouse is that, you know, I, sp I spend a lot of time talking to conservative legislators. I'm, I'm a conservative myself. And I spend a lot of time talking to conservatives to try to convince them that the conservative platform, the conservative ideology, is actually contrary 
to the current criminal justice policy. So we're, if you're a small government conser conservative, well, we love big government when it comes to criminal justice. And so we want to feel safe. And so there is this constant tension between, as a society, do we want liberty? Or as a society, do we want to feel safe? And so there is this constant tug and pull. But unfortunately, we've really gone to the side of public safety to the detriment of um, our citizens, I believe. And so this is something that you can actually check out on our website. It's, it's a values-based approach to criminal justice. And these are kind of the values that we advocate are based on uh, our biblical values and are, um, I think most importantly, their values. So criminal justice isn't just based on dollars. It's not just based, but it's based on these values. And each of these kind of colors here, you'll see, is associated to a primary um, uh, party in the criminal justice process. So the green represents the community, the uh, blue rep re represents the victim, and the orange represents those who commit crimes. So you'll see that they all have to work together. These values all have to work together in order for our criminal justice system to actually be restorative. And so and to, to change the narrative, you know, we, we have to change the language. We have to change the way we talk about criminal justice. We have to change the way that we talk about people who are in the criminal justice system. So currently in America, there's 2.3 million people who are currently incarcerated. There's over 7.3 million people, people who are currently under some form of criminal supervision. So they're on probation, they're on parole, or they're in jail, or they're on prison. Does everybody know the differences between that spectrum? Probation, jail, prison, parole. I'm going to give you on a timeline. So probation is something that you haven't gone to prison yet, but if you violate your, your probation, you will go to jail or prison. Jail is a place that you're going to go to for a misdemeanor a year or less, or you're being held for a trial. Um, prison is what you've been sentenced to for a felony, which is generally a year or more. And parole is, some, is a place that you're going to be on in the community after you've been released from prison. And so I say that, I know you guys are all, are, are all law students, but I don't think we quite understand kind of the housing um, places where people are in, in the process of the criminal justice system. So really trying to change the language because language changes culture. You guys should all agree with me watching the latest, you know, Supreme Court case on uh, gay marriage. Language changes culture. And so if we want to engage culture, we've got to change language because law follows culture. That is my fundamental belief, and I think Chuck Colson said it the best, that politicians are always five years behind culture. They're always playing catch-up. And so if we really want to change, the, change politicians, you want to change the law, you really have to try to engage the culture. And then hopefully we can get to some reforms. And so I just wanted to give a quick, a quick snapshot here of what I think kind of is the status quo criminal justice system. And you'll kind of see here the direct parties or the parties where most of the interaction occurs is between the government and the person who commits a crime. And so those are the, uh, the direct parties and the mere observing parties are the victim in the community, which means they don't have much say in the process. They're merely looking into the process and they don't have a much of a determination on how that process looks or, or how it uh, comes out, the outcomes. And so what restorative justice or what I propose or argue that restorative justice should do is kind of rebalance um, the efforts and the resources that are put in where the primary or the direct party should be between the person who commits the crime and the person whom the crime is committed. That's where most of the resources should go to and the, facili the, the facilitating parties are the, are the community and the government. Too often today, the, the government steps in the shoes of the victim um, and takes on that right, and the victim is still left out in the cold. And so this, this, this is trying to repurpose or rebalance um, the rightful place of the victim in that process. Now, obviously, when you get with crimes, you know, what about victimless crimes? And, and we'll, and we'll, and we'll kind of uh, touch that if we have some time. Okay, so that's kind of just some background I wanted to lay. But now I want to talk about kind of a brief history in the United States of kind of where did prisons come from here in the United States? Are they a new concept? Have we been using prisons as the primary form of punishment here in the United States or even across the world for a long period of time? What does the Bible mean when it says, you know, when, when Jesus said, hey, you know, make sure you go visit the prisoner? Um, you know, what does that mean exactly? What were, prisoner, what were prisons for? We have, we have a tendency to think that prisons have always been around because in our lifetimes, prisons have been the primary mode of criminal punishment in the United States. But that's not necessarily the case. Actually, prisons are a relatively new concept, at least in the way that we are using them today. So in the 18th century, um, you know, prisons were 
there were prisons obviously in the 18th century, but they were only used for political, religious, or people who were um, you know, debtors prisons, which we're kind of familiar with at least that term. So people who were in debt were put into prison, religious um, you know, um, infractions, people who violated religious beliefs were put into, into prison, and political prisoners uh, were put into prison. And that's kind of historically, even if you look beyond that, you know, we look at even how the Romans used prisons, uh, those types of things, it was very specific to, um, it wasn't looked at as the primary mode of, of punishment. And so what was the primary mode of punishment early in the United States was First, I think it's important to understand that a lot of the Christian foundations of, um, a lot of Christian foundation or Christian thought went into early criminal, criminal law in the United States. You know, most of the early criminal laws in the colonies were Bible verses verbatim. Um, not all, and a lot, of, a lot of the law came over from England, they adopted a lot of England law, but a lot of the laws were just verbatim Bible verses. Now we can argue whether that's good or bad, uh, but that's just the, that, that is just the way it was. And so punishment for violation of, of the criminal law was corporal punishment. That was the primary method of punishment um, early in the United States. And so what that included was whipping. I think that stands for itself. Branding. And so branding is interesting because a lot of people, um, you know, the early Catholics, the Catholic Church used to do this when they would, they would brand people as well. Um, but you could get branded, for example, if you were a thief, you'd get branded with a T. If you were a murderer, you'd get branded with an M. Or there would be different designations depending on the crime. you get branded on your thumb, um, on your forehead. Um, and so we all are all familiar with the scarlet letter. It's, it's literally having to wear that letter. Um, and so ducking, I'm sure not, not too many of us know what ducking is, but it's an early form of waterboarding, I believe. So you can see you know, where you get tied on the chair, you get dunked, and then you get pulled back up. Um, mutilating, you cut people's ears off. Um, there's a lot of ways that, you, that we would utilize a corporal punishment. Stocks, we're, we're familiar with that. And the pillory is kind of a different form of the stock. You kind of see where you have to stand. So public shaming. Um, actually, I'm going to go back here. And uh, banishment. And so at least England would use banishment as a form of corporal punishment. They would actually banish people. A lot of, we all are kind of familiar that we banish people to Australia. You know, Australia is the penal colony. We all kind of know that. But also, they would also banish people to the colonies, to the U.S. colonies at the time. So they would send, um, you know, people who had violated um, British common law to the United States. And so Two kind of, you know, in the, in the early colonial period, there were, there were jails and workhouses, but they're kind of different than the way that we think about them today. Um, just real briefly, talking about the history of prisons, you know, if it, it actually goes back. I mean, it, it, prison is not a new concept. It's the way that we use it is, is a fairly new concept. And so when you look at, uh, you know, even with cannibals, they would incarcerate people, fatten them up, and then they would, you know, so they could eat them later. Um, yeah, so I mean, it kind of goes back that far, um, pretty primitive. But you know, with jails at the time, so jails were used primarily for people being held for trial. And so, you know, there would be like a court docket, and as soon as that court docket was done, like all the, the jails would go out, they would get their punishment, and they would be emptied, and then they would fill back in, and it would just be kind of this process like that. And workhouses, so workhouses, you can kind of see a picture here, was primarily for people who were destitute. Um, vagrants, and so they would use it as an opportunity to kind of get people off the street and they would put them in here and they would work. So those are kind of some different concepts than what jails are um, anymore. But those two concepts combined have kind of created our current prison system. And so there was some early reform in the United States, um, and so a lot of the reform came from a push from the Quakers. So out of Pennsylvania and out of New York. And so the transition from corporal punishment to imprisonment, to imprisonment was heavily influenced by the Quakers, by the Friends Movement, the Friends Society. And the French Revolution also had a good um, impact on the United States at the time. So Montesquieu, uh, Beccaria, whose tome on crime and punishment is still looked at today, uh, who's re who researched kind of all over the, all over the world. And so they were advocating abolition of torture, need of more just and uh, accurate method at trial, reduction in the severity of penalties, uh, larger use of prisons, and improvement of prison administration. The funny thing I think about this is that if you were to look at those, um, those goals 
And you were to uh, put us in 1980, we were still av uh, advocating for the same things here in the United States. Uh, so the goals really haven't changed too much. People advocating for the types of reforms haven't changed uh, so much since uh, the early 1600s. And so, you know, for the Philadelphia Criminal Code Reform was finally passed in 1794, which is kind of the quintessential um, prison reform um, that really shifted the United States from corporal punishment to prison as the primary form of punishment. Um, and so their three things that they were advocating for was relief of physical suffering, reduction in number of capital crimes. And so, it, you know, in England at the time where a lot of states and colonies have, had adopted uh, the English common law, there's over 300 capital crimes in English law at the time. And so a lot of states at varying degrees had adopted uh, these capital offenses. And so reduction in the number of capital crimes and introducing imprisonment as a pla in place of corporal punishment. And the development of a system of prison discipline, or the Pennsylvania system. And so we're going to get into a, a discussion to talk about, again, a tale of two prisons. And so, because it's fascinating to me, and so as you can kind of see the development of prisons coming up in the United States, you see a shift from corporal punishment to developing prisons to saying, hey, listen, this is actually... Um, you know, it's torture, uh, cutting people's ears off doesn't seem to be good for um, society. I'm not sure if it re reduces public safety. I don't know what their concerns were, but a lot of it being fueled by the French Revolution and human dignity arguments, all of these types of things that we're kind of familiar with today. And so, you know, it seems like it was, it was a, good, a good shift, a good reform. And so you have these two systems that start to develop because people are starting to change the way we do criminal justice in the United States. And you have this one prison system in Pennsylvania that starts to flourish, and you have this other prison system in New York that starts to flourish. So we're going to talk a little bit about the differences about how they actually, what they were looking at, their philosophy a little bit, and then what happened to each of them and which one the United States adopted and which one Europe adopted because Europe adopt, ended up adopting one and enforcing one, and the United States ended up adopting one. And so the Pennsylvania system, I'm just going to, I know you guys can read, but I, I think this, this is the best description of the Pennsylvania system. But just a quick caveat, it puts it in a very good light. And this Pennsylvania system was very, it was not, this is written by someone who really believes in it. Let me just put that, it's biased. <laughs> uh, it's still very retributive, um, it's very harsh. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about it. But I want to read this because I think you'll, you'll see why Europe eventually adopted it, left some things behind, but kept other things. And so depraved tendencies, characteristic of the convict, have been restrained by the absence of vicious association. And in the mild teaching of Christianity, the unhappy criminal finds a solace for an involuntary exile from the comforts of social life. If hungry, he is fed. If naked, he is clothed. If destitute, of the first rudiments of education, he is taught to read and write. And if he has ever been blessed with the means of livelihood, he is schooled in a, me a mechanical art, which in afterlife may be to him the source of profit and respectability. Shut out from tum a tumultuous world and separated from those equally guilty with himself, he can indulge his remorse unseen and find ample opportunity for reflection and reformation. His daily intercourse is with good men who in administrating to, in, who administering to his necessities animate his crushed abundance of light air and warmth. He has a good and wholesome food. He has seasonable and comfortable clothing. He has the best of medical attendance. He has books to read and ink and paper to communicate with his friends at stated periods. And weekly, he enjoys the privilege of hearing God's holy word expounded by a faithful and zealous Christian minister. So that sounds like a hotel, perhaps. Um, um, now, obviously, these, you know, um, yeah, this was not the case. So actually, the way the Pennsylvania system worked is based solely on solitary confinement. And so what, what, what is interesting about this is so every individual was put in a solitary cell, and that solitary cell had access to an outside yard. Each individual person had access, access to their individual yard. So individuals here never saw anybody. They never talked to anybody who was in prison with them. That was the whole premise. The whole premise here was to be reflective and to have your own kind of penance, which is where we get penitentiary. And so the, again, this is developed prim primarily from the Quakers. And so um, the, only, the only people they would communicate with would be a guard or a, a, a visitor, um, if, if they had a visitor. And so that was it. So they were stuck in solitary confinement, but they had access to their own yard and they would give them work to do, like cob uh, being a cobbler or something specific, but they would do it in their, in their respective cell. Now, the argument against this was that this, is too, this costs too much. 
you, you can't build an individual cell for you know every single person and provide them work and all of these other things that we saw in there, you know, teach them to read, all these other types of wonderful things. Now that's very similar to the arguments we have today. People are going to argue, oh, prison's too costly. Uh, it costs too much. Uh, so a lot of these arguments are, are still happening today. And secondly, uh, not to be crass, but it drove people crazy. Um, and so it, uh, solitary confinement is nothing nice, particularly with these, uh, with this, um, uh, the way it was set up here. And so we're going to come back to the Pennsylvania system a little bit, but I want to talk again. So we then, secondly, so you have that system developing in Pennsylvania. People are taking a look at it throughout the country. You have Auburn, New York, or the Auburn system, and they start to develop a system of their own. And this is a description of their system. In their solitary cells, they spend the night with no other book but the Bible. And at sunrise, they proceed in military order under the eye of the turnkeys in solid columns with the lock march to their workshops, thence in the same order at the hour of breakfast to the common hall where they partake of their wholesome and frugal meal in silence. After supper, they can, if they choose, read scripture undisturbed and then reflect in silence on the errors of their lives. They must not disturb their fellow prisoners by even a whisper. And so the difference in the Auburn system was it may seem a little bit hard to determine what the key differences are. They're both solitary confinement. Um, so they both seem different. But the interesting thing between the Auburn system is the Auburn system shifted it inside. So there was no outside access and there was solitary confinement on the inside only. But here they would allow congregate you could actually talk to people, you would eat with people. There is no talking, but you would at least see and, 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 and uh, have um, interaction with other people. So they would get out, they would work together, and they would go back to their individual cells. And so that looks a little bit more like the current prison system. Now what happened here when they first started this, it was purely isolation, purely solitary confinement in the Auburn system. But again, they realized, hey, this is filling up too fast. We have an overcrowding problem. We have to fix it. And so over time, the Auburn system became the primary system in the United States, whereby we still use solitary confinement, but we'd also use a congregate system where you had 10 people in a cell, two double bunk. You would have all of these other types of things, but you would have people allowed to congregate together, and then you would allow, um, but you would then try to put people back into their individual cells. So, what happened over time is the Europe adopted the Pennsylvania system and the United States adopted the, uh, the Auburn system. And the reason why I bring that up is because if you read that description of the Pennsylvania system and you look at Europe currently, you say, well, that doesn't really look like it's the same. I mean, Europe is not that punitive. And if they are, they're very rehabilitative in their goals in the criminal justice system. And what I espouse is that if you read the thing in the Pennsylvania system about teaching people to read, about all of these other things. It's those things that really progressed in Europe and this other kind of punitive solitary has really digressed. But in countries such as Sweden and Norway, where you do have individual cells, a lot of the times you'll have individual cells, but you'll also have your own kitchen or it'll be much, it'll be much more, it'd be much similar to how you would live on the outside. Um, and so that is kind of the shift that they have taken in Europe. So why, why, why do I spend my time and energy kind of taking you through kind of a brief history of kind of penology in the United States? It's because I think it matters. It matters what kind of philosophy we approach the criminal justice system with. It matters what we think the goal of the criminal justice system is because criminal justice is about people. And sometimes I think we forget about who we're talking about. We're talking about numbers, dollars, but it's about people. It's always about people. It's about people first. It's about people who commit crimes. It's about people who have crimes committed against them. It's about communities of people who want to be safe. It's about people. And so when we look at a philosophy of how are we going to deal with individuals who commit crimes, what is the proper response? I think it behooves, be, be, it behooves of us as, as believers, as people grounded in the truth, to be able to say, well, we understand human nature. We understand what the value of punishment and we understand redemption. So we should understand crime. No, none of us in this room should be shocked that people do bad things, right? We all should understand depravity. Lord knows I do. Depravity is not something that we should wrestle with. We all know about it, you know? 
And we all understand punishment. We all understand proportionality at, at some level. And we can argue about, oh, what is proportionate? How do you put a metric on it? But it's much easier, in my estimation, to, to, to look at something and say, wow, that's disproportionate. Like, that's just not just. So we all have some kind of natural law, innate response to injustice. And then lastly, we all understand redemption. We understand what it means to pay for what you've done. I mean, the whole, you know, Christ on the cross, to pay. I mean, there was something that was owed, an amount. There was an amount that was owed to be atoned for. It was a specific amount. It was the blood of God. That's the specific amount. So unless that amount is paid, justice is not satisfied. And so for us, looking at that as a model, there is something that has to be given for justice to be satisfied. And so... As we kind of look and listen on the conversations around criminal justice, what do we do with, with people who commit crimes? I mean, I think, I think we really need to start asking, well, what do we do? What does that look like? And so there's kind of three primary goals of the criminal justice system or people that espouse our goals. One is retribution, which is basically like the hammer. You know, we want to give them what, what they're owed, just desserts, which is a term I prefer by C.S. Lewis. And so, but if you have... The problem with retribution, actually we're going to get there, rehabilitation is the second one, uh, then deterrence. And there's other ones that we can talk about, that I might actually talk about actually uh, profit as, as a potential um, goal. And so I just want to go over each one of these and kind of process with you what should be the primary goal of our criminal justice system. So I'm going to start talking about deterrence. So deterrence seems like a simple you know, concept. Well, if you hurt somebody hard enough, the rest of society will say, well, you, know, I, you shouldn't do that because look, that guy's in a lot of pain and I don't want that to happen to me. Conceptually, it seems to make sense, but there's flaws all, all throughout it. And the primary flaws are, number one, it's disproportionate. It's not proportionate to the harm because you're saying it doesn't matter what you did. All that matters is that society reflects and say, well, we shouldn't do that because that's bad. So it's very utilitarian. The ends justify the means. Secondly, it doesn't require guilt for you to actually achieve that end. So we could just, as a society, we could say, you know what? We don't want people to do this behavior. So we're just going to pick someone up and say, you did this behavior. We're going to punish you. And that way we'll get the deterrent effect. So it doesn't require guilt. Third, it assumes that crime is a rational process, okay? It assumes that when a person commits a crime, he's sitting there and he's saying, hmm, well, if I rob this guy and I just ask him for his wallet, I'll get this much time. But if I brandish a gun, well, man, then I'm entering a different level. And so then I'm going to get more time if I get caught. But man, will I get caught? I know so-and-so, he didn't get caught. Believe me, crime is irrational most of the time. There is not a rational response. And so people are not thinking about that. The most rational I've seen people who commit crime is this. I know, like, I'm okay doing five years or two years. I'm okay getting a nickel or a deuce or a penny to use some prison slang on you. You know, I'm okay with that, but getting a dime or a quarter is too much. Like, I don't want to do that. I can do the rest of my time. I can do that other time standing on my head, other prison slang. You know, I can do all of these things. So I know if I, you know, if I carry this much amount of drugs with me, that I'm going to get in trouble, so I need to give some away or things like that. That's the most rational I've ever met people who are in the, in, in the, in the prison system. Most people, it's, it's irrational. It's not a rational process that people go through to commit a crime. And another problem is this, there's, no, there's not 100% certainty of getting convicted. So that kind of limits the deterrent effect. Because you've got to then process, well, you know, it's probably about 50%, 25%, I'm actually going to get caught anyway. So that it, it lowers the, it reduces the effect of deterrence. And so some examples of using deterrent as a primary goal of the criminal justice system in today are three strikes laws. So three strikes and you're out, right? So California is a great example. You get convicted of three felonies, third time's life. And life in California is 20 years. So it doesn't matter what it is. It could be stealing a candy bar or whatever. If it's a felony, third, time's, third time you're out. And the question I, I like to ask is, you know, what does deterrence have to do with justice? Explain to me. What does deterrence have to do with justice? Nothing. 
all that we ask of deterrence is whether it deters. That's it. That's the question that we ask of deterrence is does it deter, not is it just. That's not part of the equation. Secondly, re rehabilitation as the primary goal of the criminal justice system. So re re rehabilitation is obviously, well, you know, we want to fix people. It's forward looking. You know, we don't want to look back in the past. You know, we got to forget that stuff. We want to look at forward to the future. We want to make people better. We want to, you know, make sure that they're, that they're for public safety reasons, that they're not going to do X, Y, and Z again. And those are all, all valid, valuable conversations. But the, but the problem here as the primary goal of the criminal justice system is who determines what criteria? Based on what? Who determines that you're, you or me are rehabilitated? I mean, and based on what? I mean, I don't know. I mean, is there a timeline? Is there, do I need to say certain words? So when I was in prison, people would go before the parole board and there would be a word getting out. Like, oh man, the parole board's really liking if you say you quit smoking. Man, they, they're, they're, they're giving people paroles because people are saying they quit smoking. Oh, that's, so that'd go around, people go for the parole board. Ah, quit smoking, you know, I feel so much better. You know, and the next thing they say, oh, people are really, you know, the pro board's really likely that you got a GED. It, it, it's silliness. So it's like, it changes, it shifts. So by what standard are we measured to be rehabilitated? And I think rehabilitation is just a poor choice of words. Most of the people I know in prison, it's not rehabilitation we need, it's habilitation, period. And if we want to habilitate people, then we need to change the culture in our prisons. Because the culture in our prisons is antithetical to the culture that we allow, that, that we say people need to live on the outside of prison. So the norms and the social norms that people live in prison and we allow people to, to, to practice in prison, and then we say, hey, congratulations, here's your parole. Now go out and live completely different on a different set of norms. But what happens is these individuals, the, the, these men and women, they walk out, they practice the same norms they would in prison, and those norms are gonna get you right back into prison. It, it makes no sense. When I walked out of prison, I, I, I learned two, I said two things. I'm a different person. I'm never gonna do that again. Secondly, man, we've got to change the way we do prison in the United States. It's antithetical to the results that we want to get. So disparity and equity concerns with, re with rehabilitation. So it's like, well, how much therapy does this person need or how much therapy does that person need? How we determine how much rehab we give that individual. It's, it's, it's disparate. And so, you know, I, I want to thank Ernie for sending me this case, this, this ECHR case, actually, because I think it's a good indication of where the European Court of Human Rights is going on making rehabilitation the primary focus of the penal system. So they say, in, in a case of Venter and others, indeed, there is also now clear support in European and international law for the principle that all prisoners, including those serving life sentences, be offered the possibility of rehabilitation and the prospect of release if the rehabilitation is achieved. While punishment re remains one of the aims of imprisonment, the emphasis in European penal policy is now, one, um, uh, is now on the rehabilitative aim of imprisonment. And so their argument, they, it's a um, very, very long opinion, but their argument is, yeah, you know, punishment could be a value when you get sentenced, but it kind of, you don't really know when it stops being valuable. And so we, we're, we're gonna say by re rehabilitation, we're gonna say, oh, if you're rehabilitated, then you know, punishment is no longer a value. And, and, and this is my primary problem. And I'm, you're, you're talking to someone who's been through the criminal justice system who has, quote, unquote, been rehabilitated. I appreciate all of this rehabilitation. But on the foundational premise of our criminal justice system, it is problematic. And I would not want to be given over to a criminal justice system that wants my best interest in heart, let me tell you. And I think C.S. Lewis is, says it the best when he says, of all tyrannies, a tyranny sincerely exercised for the good of its victims may be the most oppressive. It may be better to live under robber barons than under an omnipotent moral busybodies. The robber baron's cruelty may sometimes sleep. His cupidity may at some point be satiated. But those whose torment, um, who torment us for our own goodwill torment us without end, for they do so with approval of their own conscience. So people who are trying to make me better and, and who, who create a standard that I have no idea how to attain. And so again, what does rehabilitation have to do with justice? We demand of, re of rehabilitation, not whether it is just, but whether it rehabilitates. So we measure rehabilitation by whether we actually are rehabilitating people. And some of the examples, I think, in the United States that we see where this is starting to develop is the you see a lot of this in the juvenile justice system. We treat juveniles different in this country. Um, 
and based on the latest kind of Supreme Court juris jurisprudence, if you track juvenile justice, uh, particularly on death penalty cases, so the Supreme Court said, you know, well, we can't execute people um, if they're quote-unquote insane. Um, and so we, we made some arguments about, well, how do we determine insanity? And so, and, but then they said, you can't execute, we can't execute anybody under the age of 18. Um, and now recently it said, we also, you also can't sentence juveniles to life, to mandatory life without the possibility of parole. So that violates the Eighth Amendment to do that. And so it really kind of um, parallels in a lot of ways the uh, jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights. But I, I, think, I think perhaps the, the better analogy here is civil commitments. And what I mean by that, so in this country, a person particularly with, and this is only relates uh, to people who commit sex offenses, uh, primarily um, predatory sex offenses. Um, and so when they get convicted, they're get, they're get, they get convicted for a set of term of years in prison. But at the end of that, so they've literally served the end of their prison sentence. People will make a determination whether they've been rehabilitated. And if they have not been rehabilitated based on this body, they will civilly commit them. They will send them to an institution and they do not know when they will get out. It's indeterminate. They will go up for review. They will look, and so they, they just don't know. And so there's a great documentary done by an English documentarian on this whole thing in, in California where individuals would volunteer, volunteer to castrate themselves, to do anything they possibly could, looking for that standard. What is the standard of rehabilitation? And when the board changes, who knows? So what is that standard? And so you, you have this perpetual trying to pay that pound of flesh in a rehabilitation model that focuses only on rehabilitation. And then there's retribution. So, you know, retribution has some definition woes, I believe, because a lot of people today think about retribution in a very negative light. If you talk to people about retribution, they say, oh, that's just vengeance. That's taking vengeance out on people. And they equate it to disproportionality. And my argument is, well, of course they equate it with disproportionality. Look at our current criminal justice system. Most of our criminal justice system is disproportionate. So to say that our current criminal justice system is retributive or it's giving back what a person owes when you look at the, when you look at the uh, definition of retribution, retribute, to give back, it could actually be used in a positive light to give people reward, a, re a reward. So it's vengeance versus retribution is the argument of words. And so my argument is that retribution has to be proportionate. Otherwise, it's not of any value. And retribution has finality. At least it's supposed to have finality. In reality, no, no, particularly no felony in this country has any finality. It's atonement. It goes back to that concept of the cross, that there is a specific amount that needs to be paid. And that specific amount needs to be articulated. I can't tell you enough, when I walked out of prison, I wanted to say, you know what? It is finished. I paid what was owed. That's what I wanted to be able to say. But unfortunately, I've got to say that every single turn. So if I want to do anything, if I want to get my law license, I got to go before the board and I got to say, I paid what was owed. And they'll say, well, I'm not sure you have. You haven't done anything to us per se, but we're going to act like you have. And we're going to you know, take you through the ringer like you owe us something. Because as a society, that, that's what we think has happened. Because there's no finality. Everybody, every independent agency, every individual thinks there is a duty on them to give some kind of punishment, whether it be small or large or whatever it be, some kind of impediment. Because we have no system in this country where there is a gavel that says it is finished. But that's what retribution should do. It's different than restitution. So restitution is giving a victim back what you, what you took However, that can be articulated, whether it be monetary or acts in kind or whatever that would look like. But then there is, you know, retribution is in addition to restitution. And so my argument is the concept of desert, just desert, giving what you owe, is the only connecting link between punishment and justice. It's the only connecting link between punishment and justice. And if we're going to remove that from the justice discussion, then we're not talking about justice anymore. We are talking about something different. Now, some of you may think, man, Jesse, you're, you're pretty hard. You know, that's, that's pretty rough. Like, you're just going to send people to prison and let them rot there, and we're going to go back to the Pennsylvania system. No. 
what I'm proposing is a hybrid model. This is not an easy issue. And so my, wh what I argue is that when you go into the criminal justice system, there is a pure retribution that you're talking about because I believe strongly that punishment, if it is proportionate, has intrinsic value. It has restorative value. It has value for us as a society. If we do not punish, then there is no value. We're not actually acknowledging the dignity of both the person who committed or, or the victim of the crime as well as the person who committed the crime. If I committed a crime, treat me as a human being, please, and tell me that I'm worth as much as that individual's worth. Otherwise, you're diminishing my dignity and my value by not doing that. And so what I propose is because we have adopted a, a, a criminal justice system and, and, and have adopted imprisonment as the primary um, tool for, incar for criminal punishment in, in this country, it opens us up to a whole other discussion about justice. Because I believe that justice is based on rights and duties. I believe that justice, quite simply put, is righting a wrong. And those rights and wrongs are based on duties that people have to other people. And so when we create a system where we say we're going to send people in and we're going to leave them in there for X amount of years, and then 95% of the people that we send to prison are going to get out, I believe as a society, as a government, and as a Christian body that there is a duty because we chose to use that form of punishment. We have now also taken on a duty to make sure that we do that in the best possible way that will produce the best public safety outcomes. And so if we do not acknowledge that duty by looking at best practices and saying, well, what actually does work? What should we do with individuals who are incarcerated in our prison system? Then we are failing. And I haven't even spent any time talking about, you know, we need to stop sending half the people we send to prison anyway. We send people to prison, you know, we need to send people to prison that we're afraid of, not people to prison that we're mad at, which is what we do all the time. And so I'm going to run out of time. But I, I, this is such an important issue within the criminal justice space. You know, if you look at within corrections, which is within Department of Corrections, which are the administrators of justice in this country, they really, their job description has been about public safety. We are here to keep the safety, to, to keep the public safe, to keep the people in prison safe, and to keep our staff safe. They're not about rehabilitation at all. But there is a shift going on within corrections across this country to change the job description of people who administer our prisons to say, you know what, let's start owning some of our successes. Let's start owning some of this, you know, as a, as a nation and shifting the way we think about prison in this country. With that, it's almost one o'clock. So, for example, in Iowa, second-degree robbery is a 10-year sentence, which at the time, prior to 1996, which was when the law was implemented, if a person was convicted of second-degree robbery in Iowa, they would serve about two and a half to three years. Well, after this bill, the um, state of Iowa said, yeah, we'll increase our penalties. In, in addition, the federal government will give us money to build prisons. Well, that just makes sense, because if you increase your penalties, you're probably going to need to build prisons. So what, what it did was the state of Iowa increased their uh, sentencing structure to 85%. They adopted a mandatory minimum. They said, well, now instead of this secondary robbery being 10 years and a person serving two and a half years, they're now going to serve 85% of that 10 years and not be eligible for parole. And so we all can say, hmm, that's interesting. We just increased our, our, our penalty by 400% based on what? Someone tell me. Money. That's the only reason why, why, why we changed the law, is money. And most, almost every state took the handout. Now, the problem is, is that we say, okay, now the federal government's giving money, but the federal government's only giving money to build prisons. They're not giving money to maintain the prison, to keep the lights on, to, to keep the staff, make sure the staff has health care. So once the prisons are built, the money's gone. So the state has to pay the money to to actually feed and run the prison. So eventually the money dries up. So eventually you have a state that is filled up with people serving 400% more of their time based solely on taking an incentive from the federal government. And you've got someone with a much higher IQ is going to have to take a very, very long time to convince me that it has anything to do with justice. 
has absolutely nothing to do with justice. And if you go to any state legislature in this country and you listen to them argue about what a new crime should be, it is based on absolutely nothing. It's based on feeling, emotion. What did this state do so we can have cover because we don't want to be the only state punishing this much? Or We can't do that. So it's not based on any kind of, well, how do we actually create a system that says, you know, if you do X, it's worth this. This is how much, and this is kind of a proportionality, a proportional response. So I just, I just raise that as kind of an example of where we're moving in this country as far as how we determine what is justice. Because ladies and gentlemen, that is not justice. When I was in prison, actually, I wrote every Iowa legislator, which is 99 of them, or 150 of them, actually. I wrote every single one of them. An essay that I wrote that said, that said green doesn't mean go. It was all about this as an action and why a state shouldn't do this was bad public policy. I think you got three responses. But you know what, what, what is interesting is that criminal justice is a one-way ratchet. It is so easy to make enhancements, to make penalties more harsh. It is so difficult to turn it the other way around. And when you look at an example like this, so in Iowa, when you had mandatory, this mandatory minimum established, the Iowa legislature realized this is costing too much money. It becomes a cost-benefit analysis. I say, we got to do something. So they argued on the Senate floor for hours about this, trying to peel this thing back, and they only got it to 75%, from 85 to 75%. So that's where it stands today, or 70%, I'm sorry. So, that, so that's where it stands today. And so I just say, you know, we really have to be involved in these discussions about what is justice, what does justice require, and, and how do we actually provide some solutions to this. So I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, there's a lot we can talk about. If you have any questions at all, I'm happy to talk about them, a topic or. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yep. No, no, no. It's great. Good, good question. Yep. Right. Sure. No, it's a great question. So I think you know, with the federal government, I can't answer too specifically, but I can say that that sentencing structure was a sentencing structure that was used in the federal government and still is used in the federal government for all federal crimes. So all federal, all federal crimes, are you're sentenced to an 85% mandatory minimum with 15% good time if you earn it or earn time. So that's the automa that, I mean, that's just the federal sentencing or federal structure for serving out your sentence. And there was a violent kind of crime wave going on at that time. And so people were trying to punish, you know, lots of these had to do with violent crimes that were associated with it. Um, so that was the justification. Um, now, I guess my other response to that is we still do this on a knee-jerk reaction. We don't actually look to say, well, you know, what we're looking at is we're just saying, well, we just want to punish these people more. That seems to be the only response that we can articulate. There's no other response to say, well, we just need to keep them out of the public for longer. Um, but there's no discussion about proportionality, which I think is problematic. And I understand that proportionality is a hard concept to articulate and draw out and compare, but it's something that we, that we really need to wrestle with. So I still think that even though the federal government probably took a, a closer look at this, it's still not justification for states doing it. Yeah, right, exactly, yeah. Yeah, you know, even just the federal government in general, I mean, the first, I mean, why do you have federal crimes? I mean, we can talk about that on a federalism basis as well. I mean, state policy, police power, those types of things. But the first federal bill, crime bill, had 20 federal crimes in it. Anybody take a guess at how many federal crimes there are in Title 18 now? That was in 1920. 1920 passed the first federal bill, so there's 20 crimes in there. So it's now 2015. There's 4,500 in Title 18. But if you look a, a layer underneath that, an administrative agency law, and regulations, which Congress has given the authority to agencies, um, uh, to federal agencies to actually create criminal sanctions in, in administrative code. So if you look at the administrative code, actually, um, I can't remember which administration it was, the Attorney General's office, but they tried to count them and they gave up. 
because they couldn't count how many regulations there were that had criminal sanctions in them. So the estimate, the estimate is about 100 to 300,000 of them. And a lot of these actually don't have any mens rea requirement. They're strict liability crimes. So it's an overcriminalization. And if you are familiar with Heritage Foundation, we work with Heritage on overcriminalization a lot. But it's overcriminalizing civil activity, just non-criminal activity. So I was telling Ernie earlier this afternoon about a story about a famous NASCAR driver who was on a snowmobile. He's driving around, gets caught in a blizzard, slams the snowmobile into a tree because he can't see, stumbles around, builds an ice cave to survive, ends up getting saved the next day, goes to the park rangers and says, hey, can you help me find my snowmobile? I really have no idea where it is. They pull out a map. He says, yeah, I think I was somewhere around here. They go look, they find it, and they arrest him for driving a, a mechanized vehicle on a piece of federal property whereby it says you, you cannot drive mechanized vehicle on this property. Doesn't matter if you knew that it was federal property, doesn't matter if you had notice that you knew that it was against the law. And because of this, people are actually arguing, and I'm one of the proponents, that mistake of law should actually now become a defense. You know, we all learned that mistake of, mistake of law is no defense. You can't say, oh, I didn't know about it. But now, because the number of criminal laws and regulations that can attach and that we have no idea of being, of being noticed of. They were saying that mistake of law um, can actually be a defense. Oh, Quick now. Yeah. No, it's a great question. I think that's really hits at the pinnacle of, of what I'm trying to communicate here. And I think, <clears throat> and so I think retribution should be the primary goal, and I think rehabilitation is a value that needs to be expressed in our criminal justice system. But I think it becomes in, more involved in the justice discussion because we've chosen imprisonment as our primary method of um, punishment. And because of that, I mean, for us as a civil society or a community to say, or, you know, as a government to say, we are going to punish you this way, and then we're going to release you to our community. I mean, I think that's, uh, that, that creates some kind of duty conflict there to say, well, we're going to actually create this mechanism whereby a person's going to go in. We're not going to regulate what kind of culture goes on in that prison. So you're going to go in. You're going to live however you want. You're going to adopt whatever kind of values and norms you want. We're not going to, we, we may throw you in solitary confinement. We may have this cops and robbers game the whole time, but we're not going to take an active effort and making sure you can read and write and making sure that you can do these basic things. We're not going to let people come in from the community to actually um, uh, speak with you and try to convince you otherwise. So that's problematic. And so that's, where I, that, that's why I say it's a dual system. It needs to be a hybrid. That retribution always needs to be the core because you've got to have this sense of atonement. But at, at the other side, because we've, because we've adopted uh, prison as, as the primary um, tool of punishment, that that, create, that opens us up to a bunch more duties. And so also, I think if you just look at the community in and of itself, I think as a government, we owe something to the community. So crime actually impacts communities. So if a person breaks into a house, it's going to impact that community. And I think as a government that we have a duty to say, well, what are we going to do to make sure that that community is going to be safe? And what, so in that sense, rehabilitation can become, in some essence, part of a punishment in the sense of this individual has a duty to kind of earn the trust back of that community. So I, I think it's trying to look at all of these values, but really saying that we can't lose, you know, restorative justice, which is what I talk about all the time, really gets thrown under the bus by saying, you know, oh, it's no punishment. Punishment looks backwards. It's not about that. And I'm saying, no, if you want to get restored, you've got to have the punishment piece. Um, to go through that. It sounds like just, just to go back and we'll get to the question. I know Alicia had one. The original form of retribution court was corporal punishment, right? So if we were just cutting people's ear off, beating people across the legs, putting them in stocks, there would be no duty of the government to rehabilitate right. for the purposes of retribution. Because the chosen form of retribution today is imprisonment, it creates obligations and duties even on the government, not just on the church, right. to facilitate take care. that. So yep. to care about the Yeah, yeah, uh, that, that, that's fair. I would say that there, is, there could be a community piece in there as well, 
because crime happens not just in a vacuum against one person and another, so there could be somewhat of a community element there as well. I would say it's fairly common. It doesn't happen in every state, but it happens in a lot of states. Primarily it happens in states like Alaska and Hawaii where they don't have a lot of um, prisons. And so like for example, Alaska sends a lot of their prisoners to Arizona. Um, and in states like Arkansas where you have such an overcrowding problem where you have thousands of people who are walking the streets who are just waiting to go to prison because they're waiting for a bed to open up. So in those kinds of instances, states will look at, hey, should we just send these people somewhere else? And so that's why I say, you know, at some level, the money issue becomes part of this discussion. I don't, there is a lot of money that is made in this industry. A lot, a lot of money. So there's pri the private prisons, yeah. And they, they have to, so anyway, that's a, that's a big problem too, because poverty, who watches the third party? And then also sure. tell them what they're doing. And they're in a business, you know. And then, uh, uh, but you say you should study Catholic and have this love to have up here. What are the strategies for the church of, you know, doing these things that you're talking sure. about? Sure. Yeah, no, that's great questions. First on private prisons. Which is a great question. There are lots of private prisons in this country. <clears throat> private prisons meaning it's not, they're not owned by the state, so a private um, corporation will contract with the state, say we'll build a prison, but if we build a prison, usually in the contract language, it'll say you have to keep this prison 95% full. So I'm not against private prisons because a lot of private prisons do a much better job than the government does in a just go through UPS and, and, or FedEx any time of the, you know, recently and you'll see the differences. But, but the problem here is that contracting to keep the beds full. And so what I propose and what I've been pushing for is that in that contract language to replace it with that you're going to reduce recidivism by this much or you're going to do X, Y, and Z. So you change the metric um, as opposed to just saying, because if I have a loved one in prison, I don't care if they're in a private prison or if they're in a government prison. I want them to be in a prison that has the most opportunities. And so why not change the metric? So it's not the fact that private prisons are the problem per se. It's the way that we're contracting with private prisons. There are, there are several private prisons that are doing tremendous jobs um, as far as how they do prison. Um, and secondly, you know, how, how, how can we as a church get involved? You know, I, I think it's, it's kind of this, this progression, you know, Bonhoeffer said it the best, if you want to, you know, if you want to, um, how can the church play a vital role for the state? Well, first, you can help the state be the state. What that means is, hey, what kind of parameters should the state have? Where does it have its jurisdiction? How far does it reach? And I think we should know that. And so that's being, that's informing. So we have to know. And so on this issue, we have to know. We have to understand. So that's, what I do all day, every day, I help people understand. Um, and so, you know, and so it's just being aware of the issues. And then secondly, it's aiding the victims of state action. So if the state is overstepping its bounds, like in Nazi Germany, you know, so this was given, Bonhoeffer gave this to a bunch of German pastors who wouldn't let Jew, Jewish people come and worship with them. So he said, hey, listen, We've got to help the state be the state. Nazi Germany, we can't do that. They're not going to be the appropriate state. They are going to be oppressive. They are oppressing. They are going over their bounds. But in that case where they overstep, then we as the church have got to aid the victims of that oppression. And I argue all the time that the criminal justice system is oppressive. It reaches far too many people for far too little harm and causes lifelong damage. A felony in this country will never go away. It will always be attached to your back. Always. We have a second prison in this country. 
when people walk out of prison, they walk into a second prison. Where we, where we say we're a country of second chances, but that ceiling is very low. And we marginalize these second chance people. And then third, we can't just bandage the victims of the state, which is good to help people who are oppressed, but then to say we're going to stick a spoke in the wheel. We're going to stick a spoke of the wheel in justice itself, so we've got to advocate, and that takes, takes risk. It takes risk to go out and stop something that's unjust. And so that's what we do at Justice Fellowship, is to encourage people to, hey, sign up, join our network, at least add your voice to saying, hey, listen, we know this is going on. We're getting informed. We want to aid this, the, uh, the, the men and women who are you know, kind of caught under this wheel, and we actually want to kind of stick a spoke in the wheel itself. So, th I mean, th those are just some basic um, of things that, that you can do. And I encourage all of you to go to justicefellowship.org and to sign up for our network and just be aware of what's going on in your state, what reforms we're advocating for, opportunities that you can do, um, as well as through Prison Fellowship to say, you know, if you're looking at mentoring or volunteering or anything like that. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering how that would look like the victims in Yeah. So one of the things, one of my biggest problems with, or one of the, what I think one of the, what contributes to the largest imbalance in our criminal justice system is that, is the improper um, dispensing of mercy. And so if we think about justice, justice requires something. Justice requires X. And if we just, for face value, for sake of argument, we're going to say that the law, what the law says is, is, is what that requires. So the law requires this. So I'm a prosecutor, and I'm going to charge you. Say, well, I'm going to charge you with um, this crime. But, you know, I don't want to go to trial. You don't want to go to trial. We're going to negotiate. We're going to plea bargain. About 95% of cases are plea bargain in this country. So we're going to say, okay, we, we reach a deal based purely on efficiency, how much time I have, cost, it costs money to go to trial. So we're going to have that negotiation. Your lawyer's going to talk with me, we're going to negotiate, your lawyer's going to tell me how good of a person you are, I'm going to counter and say how bad of a person you are, but we're going to meet somewhere in the middle. And we're going to settle underneath that required amount. Now, as far as I know, that is mercy. As a prosecutor, I just gave you mercy, but I don't have standing to give you mercy. And so if you say, you know, if, if you commit a crime, if you do something to me, but somebody else comes up to me and says, oh, you know, she's really sorry. I'm like, hey, I'm not, that, that doesn't mean anything to me. You yourself have got to come to me and say, hey, I'm really sorry. And, and so, and then if, I, if you want to let me off the hook or whatever it is, the fact that you do it has so much more impact. And so trying to raise that level of interaction to say, I would argue that a victim of a crime is the only person that can dispense mercy. So if the, if the law requires this, that's what the law requires. Now, obviously, this is theoretical because it would shut our system down. But I argue if you, look at, if you want to look at a pure system, I would argue that that's what it has to do, that the victim has got to have a say and say, you know what? And I think there should be a, 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 what is required by law. And if the victim wants to give mercy, she, he or she can state it, and it can go below that. And then a judge would weigh public safety and determine if that was appropriate or not based on the public safety concerns. And so, but at that point, you're really, the victim has a lot of um, say in the process, can actually dispense mercy if they need to, but the ceiling is the proportionate response. And so what we get now with prosecutors, you get overcharging, you get all of these other types of tactics so you can force people to um, make a plea bargain. So. Chris, you have your hand up? Yeah, thanks. Jesse, um, a lot of the ideas that you talked about today are things that those of us that are too well studied for CFL last year and, and you know, we we're talking about crim law. And a lot of them seem to be based in a biblical worldview, which knowing as much as I know about Colson and his thinking makes perfect sense, right? All of his stuff is all based on worldview. How do you articulate these ideas and pitch them in a pluralistic, secular culture that's governed by relativism? Sure. How do you, how do you make a, an, a just, an idea of justice or a judicial system based on a biblical worldview work in a secular culture? Well, that's a great question, and I'm, I'm going to seem a bit like a charlatan here, but it depends on who I'm talking to. 
I've learned a long time ago when I would sit across from a legislator and I would appeal purely on moral grounds. That there are very few legislators that are going to listen to me based on a moral argument. Number one, we have to agree on the same foundation of morality. And so, number that, so that's just, you know, and then we kind of say, well, and then we got to agree on the, on the orthopraxy or how that morality is going to actually be worked out, which then just narrows the field even more. And so I realize that if you really want to be impactful in changing this, then you've got to have the correct entity to actually change people's minds. And so what I mean by that is, you know, in politics, you know, you have C3 organizations, you have C4 organizations. Now, C4 organizations can reach out and touch somebody as far as you can run negative campaign ads. You can, you can affect someone's livelihood as a public official. And so what I challenge Christians to do is, hey, listen, these are the games. If we really want, I mean, and this is the playing field. We need, to, we need to actually use the tools so we can be most effective. So let's utilize those tools. And so if I'm, I talk to colleges and churches and all different types of colleges, but when I do, when I talk to people on the left, I change my language. I'm going to still talk the same things, but I'm going to appeal to them, but I'm going to get them to agree with where I'm coming from. And so I, I can't spend my time trying to convince them that my foundation is the same, because what I'll do is I'll use words like human dignity. Because people who don't even believe in the gospel, will under, they talk about human dignity all the time. But where their human dignity is grounded and where my human dignity is grounded are co two completely different bases. But yet they understand what I'm saying, and so I can convince them to do that. But to be honest, that's not where, where the battle is. The battle is, is primarily, in my opinion, is talking with people on the right side of the aisle and trying to convince them that tough on crime, that we need a new way of thinking, we got to do, do justice differently. That's where the argument is. And so I'm still trying to learn a lot how to do that best, but that's what I've done these past five years or so, is just be more of a tactician and cut with a scalpel instead of swing with a machete. Yeah. Sure. So, I mean, there are problems with that, but um, I believe in, um, and I've seen it firsthand, that most people who come into prison, most men and women who come to prison, they don't know who they are. They don't know where they're going. They don't know why. They, they, don't, have any, they don't have any identity. And if you look at the outside of a prison, you know, I don't know how many of you have seen an outside of prison that's cold and dark and drab. The aesthetic is not that very community facing. You know, if you want, oh, that's such a nice prison. Um, but it's a really reflection of the inward condition of people who are in prison. I mean, we all look at the, you know, um, the prodigal son who's in the pigsty. I mean, it's an outward reflection of his inward condition. And that's what it is with prisoners, people who are in prison. Um, and so, but I tell you, and that's why it's great, because a little bit of hope in a dark place, a little bit of light, a little glimpse of a horizon, man, you can, you can set the place on fire. And I've been in prisons that have been completely transformed in the sense that you have one little spot of people who start doing positive things and it catches on, it catches on, until pretty soon the whole prison is a different place and the warden's saying, man, I don't know what happened here, but this whole prison's different. And so if you can change that individual, individuals can change communities. And so we have to start right there. And so individuals that go back, it doesn't mean they're gonna get swallowed. I've seen people thrive and do very well. You know, I've also seen, to your point, people get swallowed. And so I think it's just knowing your weaknesses and being able to articulate what you need and where you should go, um, you know, what's best for you. So it's just trying to get people there, you know. It's, it's trying to get people to see that horizon and to, and to, and to grasp, grasp on. But Isn't that what prison fellowship is about? I mean, yeah. coming in and bringing that hope, that right. product, right, of the gospel. Right, yeah, exactly and right. Transforming lives to a man who committed armed robbery now stands before you as a redeemed believer. Um, yeah, that's right. I mean, it's amazing. Sure. And be able to translate their environment, especially the 
They are. Right. Well, this is what I tell men all the time. When I go into prisons, when I'm in Rikers Island to San Quentin, it's on you. The opportunity is there. You know, if you have to go back to your, to your place where you came from and you know it's going to be detrimental, you can find another place. It, it's, there are very few people that can't actually say, oh, this is the only place I can do. Very few people. Now, there are some, but they're very, very few. And the thing is, I say, you know what? You have time now. You need to develop a network. You need to reach out to people who you admire. You, you need to say, hey, listen, I need to be mentored. I need someone to speak into my life. I need to develop an accountability group. There are things that you can do, even while you're in prison, that will create opportunities for you to learn and stretch your legs for whenever you walk out. Um, I, I've seen it all the time, and I, I know that men who take advantage of that and actually work their plan, set a plan, and they work their plan, they do very, very well after release. It's the men who can't see themselves beyond the gate that struggle. And so it's trying to really infuse them and, and for them to create a discipline to say, listen, this is what I'm going to do. This is how I'm going to do it. I need help. These are who I'm, I wouldn't be here today. I didn't do any of this on my own. I worked hard and I, you know, I dragged with my fingernails. But man, when I got out, I befriended a judge. I just walked up to him and told him my story and him and I are best friends. And, you know, I just started to really network and, and challenge and challenge myself to, hey, I really need to surround myself with people who can help me and open doors. Sounds like you're saying ultimately the state can't change a person. Yes. They can help, but they ultimately. It's about creating opportunities. You know, yeah. It's about creating opportunities. And I think a lot of the opportunities, to be quite honest, are on the post incarceration side. They're on us as a culture. So we spend billions of dollars on rehabilitation in this country, billions. But it's as if we tell people, here's money, or here, here, here's, a, here's a, a draft plan on how to build a car. You can build a brand new car. Here are the parts. Here's how you put it together. You get in the seat. You turn it on. It runs nice. And then we open the door, and there's no roads. No roads. Not only that, but I know men who practice that rehabilitation that we preach, both men and women. Hey, you can be anything you want. Here's how you do it. You get a network. You make a plan. You get a job. You go to school. You do all these types of things. But at every turn, people will slowly drop off because we as a society and we as a culture, we don't value that. We really don't value people coming back from that. We like the good story, but the process is messy. And the process in and of itself, we don't ever want to be the risk taker for that. So I would encourage you guys to be risk takers on second chances. If you guys are attorneys, when you become attorneys and you do criminal law and you look across and you see that empty set of eyes looking back and you think this person is like never going to do anything, you gotta, you got to work. It's got to be a discipline for you to be able to see beyond where that person can see themselves. I wouldn't be here today unless a man walked up to me and he could see me in the future somewhere in a place where I couldn't see myself, and that's great leadership. Great leadership says you can take people to a place where they never knew that they could go before. And that's our calling as believers, to be quite honest. And as we sit across from our clients, even as we send them to prison, people laugh at me and say, I'd love to be a prosecutor. I would. But the thing is, it's like, you know, even as we send people to prison, we have to have that view. Hey, listen, this isn't the end. This can be the beginning. You need to own it. You need to accept it, own it, and come out. And with that vision of that new horizon. So anyway, I could go on for a long time. But. That's good.